Yes. Bruce, what's up, man? Welcome to the Power Hour. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for having us. This Absolutely. Is America Capital. Capital. Yeah, we, we, we try to make it fun. We, we, we promise a couple things on this show. We promise that we're going to bring trade ideas. Yep. We promise that it's going to be very entertaining and that we're going to have gimmicks. So, so we're go. hoping that you can help <laughs> us with at least the first one, which is the trade idea. And mm -hmm. if you, you have gimmicks as well, we will absolutely take that. <laughs> um, but all right, guys, we, we, we wanted to bring Bruce onto the show. He runs a very interesting ETF. Um, I, I'm going to pull it up on the screen here. I'm going to put up a one year chart, but, but Bruce, can you, can you tell us a little bit about it and, and get everyone antiquated? Okay, sure. And, uh, actually we thought about the idea almost like two years ago, back then a couple of friends, you know, uh, now partners, we were thinking, what's the next thing to invest when the 40 cycle was almost over, we are looking at the 5g cycle and uh, the way we look at the 5g is not just 5g itself we we really look at it from the, the cycle perspective who might benefit from there it's it's a you know the decade long process so that's a little bit different from other like 5g etfs out there well you know we made a conscious decision to do an etf rather than you know traditional hedge funds you know uh, for the exact reason we got asked by many friends friends like you know young friends like you guys and uh, back then, like, oh, what should we buy? What should we sell? Boost and, uh, and uh, other like uh, partners got the similar questions. We were thinking, why not just, you know, uh, do an ETF? That's much easier. And uh, that put all your best ideas, to capture the, the biggest themes for the decades to come. And, you know, I feel com if I feel comfortable to put my sister's money and my parents' money into it, I should feel very comfortable to, you know, recommend that to all my friends. Okay, so see, see, I thought you were going to say, if I feel comfortable, put my own money in it. But you just upped the ante right there. You said you're putting your sister's money in it. So if you're putting your sister's money into it, that means you have a, a very, very high degree of confidence. Exactly. Well, my, my money is in there. That's a given. So I don't even <laughs> want to talk about that. <laughs> so I, I, I do manage my parents' money, my sister's money a little bit. And uh, so actually most of their dollar assets I manage for them. And I put a very significant, you know, into WGI right now, I have confidence. It's not like, you know, for short-term trading vehicle, this is actively managed ETF. You know, that's one thing I want to tell people. That's not, if you want to trade the tech exposure, QQQ and SLK and the many other things you can use. Uh, you know, uh, WGI to a certain extent, ARKK is for people who have a long-term view. You, where you park your money, especially in this environment, you know, putting into, yep. you know, a uh, 60-40 portfolio may not be the optimal solution anymore. When the rate is so low, you are looking for the, it's a growing pie story. Focus on the, where the pie is growing faster, bigger than anybody else, e everywhere else. So I think that's the thesis that you're driving this. It's a buy and hold kind of like things. Until right. the cycle turns. <laughs> and, and, and so, so like, like when you're talking about like actively managed ETF, uh, how active is it? And can you talk through some of the largest holdings of the ETF? Okay, sure. Uh, first of all, that's actually a very good question, uh, Luke. Uh, we are very actively looking at the portfolios, thinking about the new names, what should we add, what should we in. But if you look at our turnovers, it's not that much, probably much less than, you know, uh, at least like compared to ARC, much less than ARC. Last year, I believe our number is around like only like 26, uh, below 30%. That's relatively low. Why? We don't trade the quarters in, quarters out. Like again, back to the, we have a long-term view. I want to say, you know, like think about in the 40 cycle and at the beginning of the 40 cycle, if you have the faith in the guys benefited from this you know, mobile, mobile internet, you hold on to Amazon's, uh, Netflix, Google, and, uh, and Apple, you know, especially. Your portfolio has, 10 years later, your, your portfolio has been doing fantastic. So that's what we are trying to achieve in the 5G cycle. And we've tried to find the long-term, you know, winners. Well, you know, Luke mentioned, the World Cup, like right now, the top holdings in our portfolio, you got like, you know, first of all, like who might benefit from this, you know, 5G cycle. The first thing coming into our mind is like semiconductor industries. And so, you know, 5G is all about connecting everything together as much faster, you know, of speed. And it has much high like capacity. It's just 
4G is about connecting people. 5G is just extending that to connecting everything. What the, the reason we call it the digital economy because it's really a process of digitalizing everything. So come to the basics. When you try to digitalize everything, you need a semiconductor chips to power that, right? So yep. to generate to digital. So like first of all, we like semi names, and uh, we, well, you know within semi names, you get like you know exposure to the wireless communications, you know exposure to the High, high performance computing, which is like a data center slash AI. Also the traditional, you know, uh, industrial and auto part. We, we, again, back to our thesis, we stay into the long-term things. We, we have much more exposure to the first two. Uh, wireless communications, that's why you see Qualcomm, Provo in our portfolio. And also, but at this moment, we actually like the data center, high performance computing part of the semi space, especially given this ARM based, you know, uh, service, yep. you know, coming up. Is that semi space is not boring at all these days? It's consolidating. New things are coming up every year. That's so exciting to support AI and uh, hyperscalers and the smart edge computing. See, that that's where we find a lot of like exciting things going on. Uh, you, you you saw you saw uh, 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 you know uh, uh, Qualcomm uh, Qualcomm I mentioned we also like Nvidia we actually like uh, Marvel I think we think Marvel is a turnaround story also very well positioned for this you know ARM based uh, uh, that's interesting that's a stock that that I really have not heard talked about much recently at all it's an interesting well, one take a look and we like it they they over the year it's a turnaround turnaround story. Yeah, you know, here I'm gonna pull a five-year chart of this one. Mm -hmm. So, that, so there it is. Yeah, it's right. doing relatively well these days. They got rid of those like short cycle consumer-based, you know, like uh, product lines. Really, really focusing on the like a data center, data center part, especially on the ARM part. You know, like okay. a company now, like Amazon is doing their own ARM CPUs. If other like uh, hypersellers they want to do something, they if they couldn't like you know doing everything entirely entirely on their own. Arm is the perfect partner to have. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, that's the same. Oh, uh, look at. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. Please go go ahead. Okay, I was gonna say we got a couple people in the in the chat asking for for some deeper thoughts about AMD. A any thoughts on that one? Well, we we love AMD. We love AMD since Lisa Su took over the the, <laughs> the CEO position, and uh, this is the it's you know we call AMD is a boring execution. If you go to our like you know LinkedIn or like uh, Instagram. We are sharing what we saw from AMD all the time. We call it a boring execution. It's not that AMD has been doing something magically. They have been telling everybody what they are going to do since like five years back. And they just execute so well. Their technology product roadmap, every step, they have been executing so well under the leadership like, you know, Lisa Su. Well, you know, yeah. so that's the first leg of their, you know, growth. You know, they, they really, really like de-risk the, the company and having the better products and, you know, uh, 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 grow the earnings. Well, you know, that's, uh, you, everybody remember last year, like the finally, you know, the competitors, you have to throw Intel into this, you know. Last year, uh, Intel finally admitted they had troubles with their manufacturing process, right? That's the second quarter of the year and the stock, stock tumbled. And that also boosts the, 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 the stock performance AMD. That gives AMD the second story to tell, and it's multiple expansion. So it, it enjoyed that multiple expansion after Intel told everybody they kind of like fuck it up. Well, you know, things have changed a little bit. Things have changed a little bit since Pat came to rescue, try to do something for Intel, try to you know, improve their manufacturing process. And I think that's put a cap on AMD uh, at least uh, the multiple expansion story is a little bit harder to tell at this moment. We have to wait and see. But fundamentally, we just love the company, love the execution, love where they are going, and the the the, the, the theme. The you know uh, <laughs> this is it's growing. This is what I mentioned earlier. Uh, you want to focus on where the pie is growing bigger and faster. Definitely, uh, Intel. Uh, sorry, AMD is onto it. Hey guys, can you see me? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, what, what, one more question. So, so the NASDAQ is still about 5% off of its all time high. 
uh, the 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 ETF again W W U G I right. again that's the ticker there guys uh, obviously came under some pressure when, when when tech stocks corrected what what contributed to to some of that downside in the ETF like like what were okay. some of the, well, the main well, stocks well, that got hit would love to explain that it's a very very good question you know uh, well if you want to talk about that you have to talk about like you know everybody knows like uh, you know the the, the rates market 10 year treasury yield was under pressure still a little yep. bit under the pressure and that actually it has basically nothing to do with the, the stock you know equity market itself it's all coming from the the rates market uh, uh, first of all this is uh, you know hyper growth portfolio to certain extent we like you know growthy names you know no doubt about that well, it comes with a cost, a certain name, at least on the surface, it looks expensive. If you look at the, the, the traditional value metrics, valuation metrics, yep. well, although we disagree, you know, uh, it looks expensive, but if you know the business well, they are not that expensive at all. Some of them are actually very cheap, given the potential we might be able to achieve. But, you know, since the, 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 the middle of February, the middle of February, the treasury yield market is putting a lot of pressure on the financial conditions. The symptom is what the real yield, sorry, I getting into a little bit like too technical here. The real yield is rising really, really fast. It was around like negative 80 bips to negative 100 bips, which was supporting devaluation and the growth of stocks. Why? You know, when you have lower real yield and the, you know, market are waiting to give like, you know, uh, uh, companies like a higher valuation. Also, you know, that supports, you know, hyper growth names because they are all long duration assets. Most of their values are like coming from the term value, what they can deliver five, 10 years down the road. They are very sensitive to the, the change of the yep. real yield. Well, real yield is rising so fast that's put a lot of pressure on those stocks. Market were in the mode of, you know, shooting first, ask the questions later. I think that contributed to a lot of like names, no matter your good names or bad names, if you're in the growth camp, if you are in the, you know, expensive stocks camp, you get killed first. And then, you know, I think we're getting to the, 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 the step, uh, market starts asking the questions. Well, I think the, the, the good ones, the ones that are actually not that expensive, can deliver the, the growth they promised to the market, to the investors, they have the better chance to come back. Well, I do tell people, you know, I don't think the negative, the real yield is going to go back to the negative 100 bips. Probably we are going to find the equilibrium around the negative 50 bips, which is supporting the, the, the valuation of the whole market, but just not as supportive as last year. So a lot of like dream stocks, you know, the price by dreams and don't yep. give you a solid, you know, growth trajectory and uh, not able to execute should be, you know, very careful with those names. Okay. And, and Bruce, let, let me ask you one more question. So, so are, are you the one who, who's managing the, the ETF and doing the stock picking? Is, is, are there other folks at the, at the company who are doing that? Or, or how does that well, process all work? That's also another good question. We have two research teams. One is in the U.S., the other one is back in China. You look at our portfolios. We have actually pretty good like, exposure to Chinese, Asian, you know, like okay. Taiwan, Singapore. Like, so we want to be the the group, you know, it's a group of like five yeah. people now already. <laughs> we do, let's just like a hedge fund. We do the solid the fundamental research. We, we, we want to have access to the management team and the, really just know the business well on both China and the US. I think, you know, in the, in the 5G cycle, that's where the growth in terms of regions, that's where the growth are coming from. Well, at this moment, we see more opportunities with hard science, hard technologies in the US. And the soft side, the application levels are more coming from China or Asia. But that yep. dynamic, dynamic might shift or change. We won't be the one being able to call it and capture that. So yeah, so it's not only me. I have like folks, you know, working in both US and China. There we go. All right, guys. There you heard it. Bruce joining the Power Hour. First time on the Power Hour. I told him this is the ideal one. This is the fun one, the gimmicks. He definitely delivered on the ideas. Digging into some of your, your tickers out of the chat. Again, I'm going to put, put the ticker of, of the ETF. He and his team, we now know it's a team, actively manages the ticker W-U-G-I. Dropping it in the chat there. Look, look, looking for next gen, looking for tech. Bruce, thank you so much for, for joining us on the show today. Thank you for having us. Thank you, guys. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely.